which digital audio player do you want to buy this month? The Heidi's AP80 Pro came out a few months ago, so how about that? Or maybe the Astell & Kern SA700, which was released last year. Hey, the SR25 is now available for order on B8H Photo. You should be ecstatic for its minor improvements over the SR15. Oh, wait, wait! The Shanley M6 Pro is pushing new boundaries with meaningless upgrades for the Pro title. Ah, of course, we cannot forget the Hibby R3 Pro or the Hibby R6 Pro. And don't forget the Fio M15! Isn't it totally worth spending your mortgage payment this month on that? Boy, so many choices. So how about one more? Shall we talk about the newest DAP to grace the internet? Fio with apparent little fanfare released the M3 Pro, an upgrade to their M3K. Hey, why not? Let's find out if this thing has anything meaningful to consider. I will get this out of the way right now. The M3 Pro is a fantastic bargain. It costs around $80 and is absolutely unapologetically worth every penny for sound and build. But for everything else involved in the M3 Pro's experience, it is frustrating. Those who want a cheap, modern DAP, this is the unboxing you want to listen to. The M3 is $80. It is built quite well. Its internals are housed in an aluminum body that feels excellent. The shape reminds me a lot of the BTR5, just stretched out more for the screen and the necessary support hardware. For such a small device, there is a bit of weight to it, and I appreciate that. The buttons have a good clicky feel. The SD card slot is open, so I don't have to fiddle around with a stupid needle to pop open a card slot. And thankfully, the M3 has USB-C. You can check out the specs on FIO's website, and there's nothing mind-blowing. The M3 is a standard DAP in this price range. It has a 3.5mm output. It has one DAC. It has a fairly large screen. There are four buttons on the left shoulder, power, playback controls, and volume up and down. The M3 supports SD cards with up to 2 terabytes of storage. That in itself is fantastic, especially for a product this cheap. In all appearances, the M3 is a simple device that has a very specific goal. Play music off your SD card. The M3 does not support any type of streaming service. You cannot sideload Android apps, for example, and it doesn't have Bluetooth. So for those who want a device that does support these extra features, you're better off using your own phone. There's a lot to talk about regarding this little player. You may think there's not much here. You may just want to know about the sound quality, and we will get there. But I also want to discuss the other stuff Fio is marketing about this DAP, stuff that I find really odd, unnecessary, and nothing more than gimmicks. But to put you out of your misery, let's start with the sound quality. The M3 is a pretty easy DAP to listen to. The ES9218P DAC isn't the most resolving. It is not analytical. Neither is it warm sounding. It is just a touch above neutral. I am so very thankful to ESS Sabre and FIO for not giving us another harsh Sabre DAC. Whenever I see an ESS Sabre logo, I cringe. I have PTSD from previous Sabre experiences. Gladly, the M3 is smooth to listen to. It is clearly a mass-market DAP, which is demonstrated through the slightly U-shaped tuning. The bass is very slightly elevated, the treble is slightly rolled off, and the mids have a slight amount of veiled nature to them due to the slightly emphasized bass. I know, there's a lot of slight going on here. Male vocals sound clearer than female vocals. This, of course, will also depend significantly on your audio recording and headphones. One thing that is evident for both male and female vocals is that the M3 has a smooth presentation in that frequency range. Harshness and sibilance is stamped out. If you have poorly recorded or highly compressed music, the M3 is the player for you. On the other hand, if you have high quality files, the M3 will render them with the slight tonal adjustments I just described. Guitars sounded mesmerizing on the M3. The famous American folk singer Guy Clark was renowned for playing his acoustic guitar in songs. The way the M3 renders the guitar in his songs is soothing. The guitar has a slightly longer reverberation than truly accurate and cuts right through the mix. The overall picture is that the M3 is close to neutral. It has an easy to hear tonality, one that is leagues apart from the typical Sabre DAC harshness. 
I wouldn't say that the M3 necessarily has the same feel how sound as Fio's other DAPs. I think there is a slight but noticeable difference. The M11, for example, has some grain and treble oddities that make the treble sound less smooth than the M3. The M15 is more analytical in all respects. The M6 is a little bit warmer sounding than the M3 is. It is very hard to conclude that Fio actually has a house sound. If they do, then they certainly do not try to make everything sound alike. It is probably more accurate to say that Fio has a basic idea of the sound they want. My numerous experiences with Fio DAX, amps, and DAPs leave me with the following impression. I think Fio's house sound is one that is slightly warm. The bass typically is a few decibels above neutral, the treble is usually well extended but not harsh, and the mids sound thick, having a push that brings out either male or female vocals. And all Fio players have one thing in common. They are not particularly excellent in enhancing detail. Even the M15 is not a reference DAP in the strictest terms. That said, I think Fio tries to keep its players close to the locus of house sound. Each player does something a little differently for better or worse. The M3 Pro simply falls into that concept. For my initial test with the M3, I paired a very well loved and widely lauded IEM. I used the Moondrop Starfield. I have yet to unbox and review the Starfield. Let's just say it's an excellent IEM with a U-shaped signature. The question for me was what IEMs do I use with this $80 device? Should I pull out the Campfire Audio Andromedas or the Maze Ray of Penta? Or should I use an IEM that most people can afford and pair it with a player that is in the same budget? To me, it made more sense to use a popular and rightfully well-regarded IEM like the Starfield. The Starfield and M3 complemented each other. What I got was a pleasant, slightly warm sound that fit a lot of songs and genres. Vocals sounded thick but not overly detailed. The bass was present without bloating. The mid bass and sub bass separation was lacking, but that is more an issue with the Starfield. I'll give you a few examples. Guy Clark sounds dead center and slightly forward in every song. His gruff, gravelly voice has a smooth timbre. The acoustic guitar he plays has a slightly longer reverberation than what is technically neutral and accurate, but pleasant nonetheless. In the song El Coyote, the fiddle and guitar sound clear, but slightly behind Guy's voice. There is a very similar presentation in his song Tornado Time in Texas. Hazel English has a stunning, beautiful voice. Many of her songs are mastered to portray her voice as one step behind the mix. The M3 and Starfield combo stayed true to this. Her voice was never harsh and never sibilant. Songs by the band Daughter were a little different from the ones by Hazel English. Daughter's female vocalist sounded clear and dead center. This band uses electric guitar and some drums, but the vocals kept ahead by at least one step. The vocalist has some natural sibilance, which was thankfully rolled off just enough to not cause fatigue. Orchestral pieces like Mountains by Hans Zimmer sound pleasant but are far from accurate. The sub bass rumble present from the beginning of the song to the very end is simply undercut. Details are missing and instrument separation is mediocre at best. Scurs of 4X Wings was a different experience. The rolled off treble was just about right. There was extension but no harshness. Consequently, the instrument sounded lively, though lacked the hard separation within a given group set. Once more, the sub bass was a little lacking, but the overall presentation was easy on the ears. The M3 has a 60 step volume counter. This is, of course, arbitrary. I don't think each step is a set amount of decibel increases. Regardless, the Starfield was properly driven and got plenty loud at step 20. I also tried the Tin Hi-Fi T2 on the M3. The T2 is close to neutral but not entirely there. The treble has some elevation and the bass is rolled off. The mids are pretty flat. On the M3, the T2 had a slightly emphasized bass presentation. The bass reverberation seemed just a tiny bit longer than on true neutral or more neutral DAPs. The treble of the T2 seemed a little more tame as well. This change was quite welcomed. A good example of this came when I played Scurzo for X-Wings. Typically, the T2 would be a little too harsh on the horns and brass, but the M3 was able to curve those peaks just enough so that the T2 presented a more forgiving sound. There was no harshness or peakiness. I then switched to the Sennheiser HD6XX, which are 300 ohm headphones. Now don't laugh, just listen to this. 
The M3 drove them like, well, a pro. I was pleasantly surprised to find that at volume step 45, the HD6XX was plenty loud, a touch too loud to be totally frank. My initial impressions about the M3 sound signature was confirmed when I switched to the HD6XX. As you might know, the 6XX is a dark sounding headphone with an emphasis on vocals. Its bass is present but not detailed, and its treble is extended without harshness. The M3 did not make the HD6XX darker or muddier. The vocals sounded undistorted and retained the patented Sennheiser sound. The slight bass bump that the M3 has in its tuning didn't really add anything, however. I then switched to the newest planar magnetic headphone on the market, the Gold Planar GL1000. It's a headphone that's currently available only in Asia, and I got it by mistake. This is supposedly a $300 headphone. I will absolutely review this headphone in the future because it is an absolute keeper. The GL1000 is a 52 ohm planar magnetic headphone. It has a neutral, clean, clear sound signature. The treble is well extended without any harshness or oddities. The bass is deep and has excellent separation between sub bass and mid bass. The sub bass is not emphasized and there is a slight roll off there. Vocals sound crystal clear and have a hard separation from the bass. Details on the GL1000 are exceptional, especially for the price I paid for them, which is the price of the GL600. In reality, the GL1000 has some of the best detail I have ever heard, period. The GL1000 on the M3 sounds clear and undistorted. The slight bass bump on the M3 is, yet again, hard to perceive. This is the same result as it was with the HD6XX. There was no sibilance or harshness in any of the songs I played. Detail was found all throughout the frequency range, from bass to mids to treble. The M3 easily drove the GL1000. I achieved a very comfortable volume at step 32 out of 60. Moreover, the M3 was dead quiet. I could not hear any hiss or noise or distortion with either the Starfield or T2 or 6XX or the GL1000. Once again, I have to emphasize how bogus the THX hype trade is. Theo's control over the amplification should be commended. The takeaway is that the M3's particular U-shaped signature is easier to sense on IEMs than full-size headphones. The larger drivers of the HD6XX and the GL1000 and the different structures therein do not really adopt the M3's DAC sound. Frankly, I don't think anyone would mind. Both the 6XX and the GL1000, which by the way I got by mistake, did I mention that? Sound brilliant by themselves. I personally wouldn't want any coloration to these headphones. As you might recall, I recently got an iPod 5.5. I plan to use it against every new DAP and headphone I review. Think of it as an old classic versus the new kids. The iPod has a Wolfson DAC that has a slightly warmer sound signature than the W3's DAC. It's more V-shaped than the W3. I tested the T2 on both the iPod and the W3. My impressions were immediate. The iPod had a more emphasized bass and slightly more emphasized treble than the W3 did. Going back and forth with Scurzo for X-Wings, it was readily apparent that the W3 has less bass emphasis and more treble roll-off. This test is relevant because iPods were tuned more for the mass market sound preference, not accurate, in other words. In comparison, the W3 has a more relaxed sound signature that is noticeably closer to neutral. I also tested the GL1000 on the iPod. There was a noticeable difference again in sound signature when I switched back and forth between it and the M3. The iPod forces its sound signature onto the GL1000, whereas the M3 is much more neutral. Whereas the M3's slight U-shaped sound is barely noticeable on the GL1000, the iPod's more aggressive sound does affect the GL1000. The bass on the GL1000 is more impactful with more muddiness on the iPod. Vocals are a little thicker with slightly more warmth and a little bit more veiling. In comparison, the W3 has vocals that are less emphasized. The treble increase in the iPod also transfers over to the GL1000. However, since the GL1000 controls treble exceptionally well, the pairing never got harsh. Amplification was also drastically different. The iPod volume was set at 60% for the T2. The volumes didn't quite match between the two devices, but it was close enough. On the GL1000, the iPod needed to be around 90% volume for sufficient volume. 
However, it did not appear that the drivers were getting sufficient power. The drivers sounded a little looser on the iPod, providing a muddier experience than they did on the W3. It is quite amazing to see how far technology has come. I was very skeptical of Fio's BTR5, an overly hyped and underperforming Bluetooth device. I got a lot of flack from people who never compared the BTR5 to any other competitor, and I'm sure I lost some subscribers. Well, big deal. The problem with Fio products is the bloatware they add, which is their UI and so-called features. Fio included a few features in the M3 that make no sense at all. First, there's a dedicated calculator on a digital audio player. Why? Second, there's an e-reader app. On a screen the size of the M3s, reading large amounts of text is a pretty dumb thing to do. Every single smartphone has a larger, more appropriately side screen for ebooks than the M3 does. Third, there is a photo viewer application. You know, this was a thing back when the iPod Photo came out. Steve Jobs tried to get people excited about seeing highly compressed JPEGs on the less than adequate iPod screen, and people weren't that impressed with this gimmick. The M3 screen is great, it is bright and vivid, but who needs to look at photos on a DAP? The M3 screen is elongated, which means that every photograph will be squeezed down to fit the small center portion of the screen. If I want to look at photos, I think I can do that on my phone much better. Fourth, Fio included a voice recorder application. There is a very tiny microphone on the bottom next to the USB port. I tested it. The microphone was terrible. Again, why? I kept asking myself this one question over these four features. What's the purpose? Every single one of us has a smartphone that does every one of these things and does it better. Adding features that nobody will use is nothing new. There are plenty of features in DAPs and smartphones that we don't use. The fact that they are included and unused is neither here nor there. But the stupidity behind adding such features to a device like the M3 is frustrating. It's frustrating because it shows a total lack of common sense from Fio. I shall give you several reasons why. First, none of these apps work smoothly. Every single one hesitates in operation. You have to tap repeatedly for the on-screen buttons to register. The bread and butter of the M3 is, of course, the music app. But try to move the playhead and you'll quickly see yourself tapping and tapping and tapping for the app to register. Sliding the playhead is slow and jittery. Tapping on the screen to one point or another works much better. And God help you if you try to move the playhead when it is at the very beginning edge of the screen. You'll end up triggering the screen to the previous screen page. Moreover, the ebook feature is pretty lame. The M3 will place a folder on your SD card labeled ebook. You have to place a .txt file within this folder for the ebook application to read the documents. The popular EPUB formats will not work. So, essentially, the ebook application is actually a simple text reader. To test this so called feature, I downloaded a .txt ebook from the Gutenberg library. The M3's rendition of the document was less than stellar. In fact, it was downright embarrassing. Turning pages showed noticeable hesitation and screen tearing. Text formatting was in shambles. To be fair, the text looked fine on the white on black formatting, but it was too small. There is no way to increase the text size or change fonts. All of this just underscores how wrong it is to call this app an ebook reader. The gallery app shows photos, and that's really all you need to know. If you do not have photos on your SD card, the application will simply populate album art cover that is part of your music folder. Watching photos render onto the screen reminds me of the early days of personal computers when the CPU had to crunch every single line of the photo and it appeared little by little, line by line. I thought we were well past that. But no, Fio thought it was good enough in 2020. Just look at these photos slowly, painfully rendering on screen. The calculator application works fine. It is a little sluggish, but it is responsive enough. Needless to say, your phone's standard calculator is faster and easier to use. If you calculate something on the M3's calculator, then in the middle of doing your gravitational equations, decide you need to change to a different album and hit the home button to get into the music app, you will find that you've simply ended up closing the calculator application and erasing the entire calculation that you were doing for your gravitational equations. 
The voice recording application, as I mentioned earlier, is a pointless feature. The microphone is truly bad. And to put the cherry on the top, the N3 struggles to multitask. I mean, technically it can multitask. If you play music, then jump to another application, the music will continue to play, so it is multitasking. But as you navigate and use the other apps at the same time, you will notice that those apps do not respond to input immediately. In fact, if you multitask, you will from time to time find that the apps will crash. Now, this is not a hard reboot of the M3, but instead, it will close all apps currently working. Thus, if you're listening to music and reading your .txt file or viewing photos, the music and ebook or photo apps will close altogether. Once this happens, you can't simply click on the Now Playing icon on the home screen and go back to whatever you were listening to. The music you were playing won't be there. Instead, you will have to navigate back through the browser to find your music folder and start all over again. My hypothesis is that the M3 has scary little RAM. It is enough to run one app at a time, but ask the M3 to do two things at once and the memory buffer will get overloaded. It's just too much for it. I bring all of this up because Fio spent a lot of effort on its website promoting these applications. You need to know Fio is shoveling malarkey into your face. There are two points to make here. First, applications are downright frustrating to use. They are slow, sluggish, and do absolutely nothing that the phone you always keep in your pocket cannot do better, faster, and with less hassle. Second, I would have preferred that instead of porting over Android apps to the M3, Fio had done more to either optimize the music player application or put in more RAM or a better CPU. The sluggish performance in this player is obviously hindered by either a lack of sufficient RAM or an outdated CPU that can't even run whatever watered-down operating system Fio is using here. The lack of attention to the music player as a music player is further enforced when you consider the EQ options. You cannot access EQ through a drop-down menu. In fact, there is no drop-down menu of any sort. Instead, EQ is activated by tapping three dots at the bottom of the album art. This will bring up the EQ selection. Or alternatively, you can select it through the Settings app, but that requires navigating out of the Music app. Tap on the EQ option, and you'll be taken to several EQ presets. Let me emphasize this. These are Fio's EQ presets, which means that they are dog shit. Fio's EQ presets are so poorly tuned that jumping from one to the other either demonstrates little change or far too much change. It all depends on the track. These EQ presets cannot be modified. You cannot create your own EQ setting. And whenever you switch from one EQ setting to another, there is an audible popping sound. I have used many DAPs from various brands. Assel and Kern, Cowan, Hibby, Kalex, the Bit, Opus, Shanling, Lotu, and cheap Chinese no-name brands. And Fio has hands down the worst EQ settings of any DAP brand ever, period. It is incredibly frustrating to have an EQ option with presets that simply work poorly. What's the point of having them? I'm sure that there are some Fio fans who feel I'm being too harsh with the poor little Fio Incorporated. I would disagree. Fio is notorious for shamelessly promoting the features in its applications, and those features have never, not once, worked as promised. Yeah, those applications do stuff, but never smoothly and rarely according to the hype. The BTR5 application, for example, is a buggy mess with no options worth considering. The M11 and M11 Pro's all to DSD option was much ado about nothing. The setting either made no sonic difference or made such little difference that all to DSD seemed unnecessary. And here we are with another feel product that touts certain features that have little attachment to reality and functionality. I don't care that these applications are present on the M3. I won't use them, and I am not bothered that they exist. But I am bothered that Fio put in the effort to include these applications and seemed satisfied in their lackluster performance. The sluggish response in the player is a little hard to accept. Fio is not alone in skimping on performance to increase their profit margin. Even Astral and Kern players have sluggish performance, despite their stratospheric prices. And yes, concessions need to be made for a device that costs $80. I will give you that but Fio simply cannot bank on being the cheapest of the lot. For a little bit more money, for example, you could buy the Shanling Q1, 
If sound is all that matters to you, then the Q1 is no worse than the M3, but the Q1's performance is faster and less jittery. Would you pay another $30 for the Q1 if your overall experience was less frustrating? I know I would. Okay, FIO fans, take a deep breath. The worst is over, I promise. Despite the annoyances in the M3 Pro, this little device is still impressive. Its ability to undercut every other modern DAP in price is, by itself, something to be commended. Clearly, FIO has perfected its sourcing and manufacturing pipelines. Think about it. Only a few years ago, build quality like that of the M3 Pro would cost you a few hundred dollars at least. The Heidi's AP80 and Hibby R3 were smaller and, though had good build, still cost at least double what the M3 costs today. The M3 screen is something to be proud of, especially for $80. The AP80 had a crunchy screen that looked like somebody's very ugly sister fell out of a tree and hit every branch down that landed in a mud puddle. Not pretty is what I mean to say. Here's another fact. Many years ago, Astro and Kern made a tiny player called the AK Jr. Its performance was terrible back then, and today using it feels like you're living life at 3 frames per second. And yet, it still costs between $150 and $200. Enthusiasts pay that hard cash. Yes, the M3 misses out on a few things that might be useful. There's no Wi-Fi and no Bluetooth. But since you can't stream content anyway, Wi-Fi doesn't matter. And if you want Bluetooth, I suppose you could add a cheap adapter to the 3.5mm port. For $80, FIO gives you a reliable DAP with good sound that should appeal to most. The ability to use 2TB SD cards opens this little player to be more than a throwaway item. The M3 is the perfect size to use as a music transport, for example. Imagine this. Fill your SD card with all your music and plug it into the M3. Slap a Velcro strip to the back and then attach it to the Chord Mojo. But maybe your sites are on an amp deck with better build and performance. You could go ultra premium and buy the Wu Audio WA8 or WA11 and use the M3 as a cheap but excellent transport. The M3's USB will also send audio out, and both the WA8 and WA11 will accept audio input through the respective USB ports. The point is that you get a whole lot of actual functionality. Forget the laughable voice recorder, calculator, ebook reader, and photo gallery. Those things are gimmicks that do absolutely nothing positive. Try to accept the M3's sluggish performance. The only DAP that so far has come close to the performance of a modern smartphone is the FIO M15. But even then, I can tell that there is just a bit of lag. As long as you understand that the M3 is a little slow, your expectations won't be undermined. Does the M3 provide enough to warrant buying it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you could pay another 30 bucks for the Shanling Q1 and be happy. But other than the slightly faster response of the Q1, it doesn't do anything else better than the M3. And of course, you could pay more than double for the Hibi R3 Pro. Or you could just keep climbing higher and higher in the price brackets until you empty your bank account. But if you're more down to earth and are not concerned with having analytical sound signature, the M3 is a no-brainer. It really is that good. A lot of this has to do with the fact that FIO is selling the M3 cheaply. Were it the same price as the Q1, we would be having a very different conversation. Clearly, FIO recognized its target market and its competition, and made the right decision on pricing. I will obviously continue to use and gather experience from the M3. I will compare it to the R3 Pro and the Q1. But, yeah. If you're inclined to give this $80 diamond in the rough a try, I fully endorse it.